So everybody had a good lunch time or whatnot? I had a a brand new lunch experience. <laughs> I'm in an area that's full of culture. And they gave me a brand new lunch experience. I had one yesterday too. That was a brand new lunch experience. So I've had two in a row. I'm doing good. Awesome. I'm going to try to stay sitting here just to relax and stay calculated. If I get up, it'll be all right. So question and answer time. I love question and answers. Let me encourage you for your sake. I, if somebody comes to me from a wrong place, I've, I've been a pastor. People do all kinds of stuff sometimes. It's, it's, I'm not saying this for me. I'm saying this for you. Please always keep your heart in a good place. When you're asking questions, don't already have an answer. Don't do it as a challenge. Don't do it to prove somebody else wrong, right? We've just gotten in trouble in the body of Christ with a lot of this stuff. And I noticed in the Bible, when they asked Jesus a question from the wrong place, he never answered it. He asked them a question. And what it did was it confronted their heart. He's so wise. Jesus is pretty wise. So they'd be like, uh, teacher, tell us. And then he'd say, well, let me ask you a question. Bam. <laughs> It's like, God, oh, you're really cool. So I'm not going to do that to you today, but uh, I, I just want to encourage you. Question and answers are awesome. Just be teachable. Be humble when you ask a question. Uh, and I'll do my best to answer. If I can answer, if I don't know the answer, I'll tell you I really don't know. Uh, it usually doesn't happen. The word answers things. So uh, we'll have fun with this. So let's just kick this thing off. Let's just get rolling. What kind of time frame do we have? Four? Wow. This is, wow. Hope you have a couple questions. Well, actually, I have long answers sometimes, so I really do. I know that doesn't surprise some of you, but uh, I have long answers usually. Quick, small questions, bam, long answer. So go ahead. Let's do the question time. We can do it. Yes. I have a question I saw on your on YouTube that I really enjoyed, and I wish that you could uh, answer it longer this time because I only saw like five minutes of it. Um, and it is a question about tithing. Um, you know what I mean. So okay. I really wanted to hear more of that. She um, came right out of the gate with this I question. sure did because I came here saying I want to know Pastors more. Pastors are sitting there going, what's he going to say? Because <laughs> truly, it truly blessed me. I, I did move on it, but I just wanted more because we just did a little bit there. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of talk in the church on tithing, of course. There's tithing scriptural. You see tithing in the Bible. You see the Old Testament standard of a tenth of your increase of first fruits. So... Uh, there's people out there that say, you know, there's no tithing standard in the New Testament. Jesus just said it was all about the heart. I personally tend to agree with that. There's other people that say, well, yeah, but tithing was before the law. Tithing was way back as far as Abraham. So it was. Here's my concern with standards and things that we do. We miss the heart of giving. We miss the heart of what we're doing, and now we live obligatory. So we just say, well, you're supposed to do this. You're supposed to do this. And and we miss the heart of things. In the New Testament, uh, everything you read on giving and, 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 and tithing, and even when he talked to Pharisees, you know, you do this and this and this, you miss the greater part. And he talked about the things of the heart. Uh, what I'm simply saying is we, we don't need to ever get in a fight over this. If you actually understand what I'm saying, you give from the heart. You're a cheerful giver. You become in fellowship with Jesus and, and you become love. Tithing in a percent and a standard won't even be an issue. You'll find yourself, you're really a giver. So no pastor should be threatened by what I'm saying. I'm a huge giver in my life. I don't even know what 10% looks like. I don't think 10%. I think Jesus blessed me, I've become a blessing. Jesus has given me everything I'll ever need and in many ways, and I'll give whatever I can to others. So personally, I'm not a 10% thinker. But when I look at my life, I give way more than 10% of my monies, goods, and life. So I don't, I don't preach that you have to tithe to be a member of our church. I just don't. I'm not asking. I'm not telling you I'm, I'm right. It's a heart issue. I try to protect the heart of giving. I've seen countless people tithe in a legalistic mindset because they were told they have to, they better, or they won't be blessed. And they tithe, 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 tithe. And I know we uphold a lot of testimonies of people that got blessed and the winds of heaven opened. But I've met a whole ton of people that have tithe and tithe and tithe and tithe and haven't ever made ends meet. And 
actually have debts. And it's not because God's not faithful. It's the heart of giving. The heart in giving to me matters more than anything. So don't get caught up in a tent. Get caught up in a heart called love. You follow me? And I'm just being honest. I I live a certain way. I live I live humble. I, I live I'm pretty I don't have a lot of needs. I'm not a materialistic guy. I've lived in the same house for 30 years. June will be 31 years. Same house. I paid off my mortgage when I was 42. I'm still in the same house. Not a lot of people do that. They get bigger, better, the American dream, keeping up with the Joneses or whoever they are. I'm just telling you, it's my choice. I'm not saying it's wrong if you do that. But it's more demand, more financial responsibility, now you're in your 50s and you still have a mortgage and you didn't have one in your 40s because you're trying to better and stuff. I just have a different view. I think for the kingdom, I'm satisfied, my needs are met, I love the bed I sleep in, my house is enough for me. It empowers me to give a whole lot more. And I am a major giver, more than you have any idea. I'm a major giver and it has nothing to do with 10% if you know how much I give. So I'm not afraid to preach this thing because if we really get it, our hearts will speak louder than the law. Are you following me? So no, no pastor should be threatened by what I'm saying. Oh, wait, real quick. If you read the New Testament and Jesus' teachings, there is no percentage standard in anywhere in the New Testament. There is none in the New Testament. The only standard you see is way back in Abraham, and that was before the law, so I understand people's argument there. I'd rather you and I not be bound by a standard. I'd rather be bound by the heart of God and by love. Are y'all following me? Okay. So. Nothing's yours. Nothing's really yours. So when you say 10% and, hey, God only asks for 10%, you get to live off the 90. God just wants your 10%. Really, God wants your heart. He wants the heart of a cheerful giver. So it's not your 10% that the possessor of a cattle on a thousand hills is after. <laughs> He's after your heart. He's after your heart. And, uh, you know, the widow lady or the, or the lady in her might, yeah, the widow lady in her mind, you know, Jesus said she gave more than all of them. It's an issue of the heart. I mean, she barely put anything in there, guys. And Jesus was like so touched by her because she really didn't have anything to put in there, but she, she put in what she had. She didn't cut it in a tent. She gave it. And Jesus said, wow, she gave more than all of them. Which tells me Jesus is teaching us giving is totally of the heart. It's not a standard. It's not a legalistic thing. It's not a percentage. It's hard. That's, that's my conviction. Not saying I'm right. I'm not here to get into theological ar argument over that. I, uh, I've been around other pastors. I've pastored friends. I've been in other churches. The tithe is held up strong. If you remember this church, your tithe. And staff are the tithers and the encrusting in churches. You know, I'm not a tither. I'm beyond a tither. I know I'm a giver. I give way beyond the tithe. <laughs> so, yeah. All right? Y'all good? Okay. She came right out of the gate with that question. All right, go ahead. Y'all might want to just sit down until I get done answering and just jump up because you might be standing there for a while. I give long answers. First, thank you, Dan, and thank the Lord for bringing Todd White to you. That's what encouraged me to take the first step out. Now that I've experienced what I've experienced, I do contribute everything to the Lord and to Jesus, but I feel very convicted as of recently and especially after speaking to some elders in my church yesterday about um, feeling too much that it's from me, but I don't. It says, where do I draw the line at um, or how do I communicate my experience is to be a blessing to others and encourage others to do the same without making it seem like I'm the one doing this. Because I always do contribute it to Jesus and say it's to Jesus. When right. something happens, I always 
speak of Jesus and so forth. So just your thoughts. If you're feeling like you're being interpreted as this is always about yourself, this is about you and what you're doing, which isn't in your heart. Correct. Correct. That's what you're being, that's what's being said. Correct. Yes, sir. No, I get that. I've seen that scenario a whole lot. Uh, Sometimes, too, that we're excited. We got a new truth. You hear something you've never heard before and it gets your heart excited and then you become a telecaster of that truth. You want to tell everybody you meet? No, but you might not. I'm not putting this on you at all. I'm just starting off. This has nothing to do with what you said. I'm not relating this to you. You don't really have a revelation of it yet. You're just excited about it. It's something new, so you're trying to, to declare it. We always teach, don't feel like you need to just declare it. If anything, hey, check this guy out, or you might want to listen to this. Don't try to become another sounding voice. Get established in that truth to where that truth becomes your life. Your life will give you a platform in men's ears. Your, your life lived is what will gain respect. It's not about doctrine. It's about your life lived. So, so, And even in your life lived, people will still read into what they think you're doing. They just will. You have to be more secure than that. And at the same time, look at how you come across. Do I need, like I didn't, I never went around in my life and told people, hey, you got to do this. You should be praying. You should be this. Check this out. I, I just lived my life and people saw it and went, what is this? And realized it was Jesus. So I was four months old in the Lord, asked to serve in the altar ministry. Four months old, guys. Come on. I'm six months old in the Lord. And I'm teaching a class at church. I'm nine months old in the Lord and I'm ministering in churches as guest speaker. I'm not even a year old. Why? Never said anything to anybody. They saw my life. They saw the fruit. They heard my communication when they asked me and talked to me. So I hear your heart in wanting to get everybody stirred up. If anything, direct them to the source of where you got it so they're not relating it to you as if you're coming across, now you got something they don't, right? If there's weakness in people, the way you touch them can surely bring it out. If you have a pastor and you go to a power and love conference, you go to a Todd White weekend, or you do something and you go out in the streets in a group and all of a sudden God gives you a night here and you're ramped up, man. You're like, yeah. The, 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 we have a whole session at Power and Love to tell you to never do this. Don't go back to your church and say, Pastor, we got to be doing this. We've been missing it. Your pastor's praying. He's seeking God. The best he understands, he's doing the best he understands. Even if your pastor's missing it, he doesn't believe that. He's not evil and wicked. Come on. He's trying what he understands. And he's... So the best thing you can do is live it and model it and let people see it and attach to it. To where your pastor actually says, man, what's going on with you? Ever since you went away that conference, you've been so different. What? And all of a sudden, he's asking you, and now you're telling him testimony. Some people are broadcasting everything that God seems to do in their life and people are interpreting as, what are you trying to tell me for? Well, what are you saying about us? Well, what are you doing? And then they get edgy. If there's weakness in your pastor at all, you'll really locate it if you start telling him how awesome this weekend was and pastor, we've been doing it wrong here. We need to start incorporating. You need to listen to these men. I've had pastors tell me that they resented my name so bad that they thought if they'd hear my name one more time, they would just go and choke somebody. Because their people in their church were listening. They always felt threatened by it and challenged by it and upstaged by it. And it might not even be the intent of the people. They're just excited, but they don't understand what they're doing and how they're coming across. So all of a sudden, the pastor's mad at a good thing because it's being misrepresented to him. It might not even be misrepresented. It's just how he's hearing it. We have to have discernment and recognize how people are hearing things. And if somebody does that to you, pull back and realize, not pull back from your lifestyle, pull back from your expression to them. You see what I'm saying? Because you don't have anything to prove. You have the joy of becoming. So you're not trying to convince anybody. You don't need anybody else to jump on page with you for moral support. Jesus is in you, and he's Lord, and it's enough. And go ahead and love people, man. Right? And, and as you're doing it, you, it's amazing how God works. All of a sudden, you'll touch somebody in a store, and the person you touch is the neighbor of the person that thinks wrong of you. It's crazy. I can tell you so many crazy stories like that. You, you'll be ministering to somebody, all of a sudden it's a relative of somebody that's saying you're out of balance. And then the relative's saying, no, you don't understand. That guy just met me in Walmart and it was ridiculous. God's presence called me. I don't even have any pain, man. Like, 
Really? No, seriously, I think you need to reconsider what you're saying. That God can do that stuff. Here's the thing. You don't defend yourself. You don't justify yourself. You live sincere and upright and let God defend you. He's your rock and defense. Anytime you defend yourself, you give people the position of being your judge. Then they have to decide. If I don't defend myself, then I'm free to just keep living my life in Christ. And they're subject to presumption. And they have to deal with their own heart and conscience. As soon as you defend yourself, you enlist people and hire people on as your judge. You follow me? Yeah, because I just leave it on. Okay. Um, we're going to run the mic to you guys because I think okay. there might be a, some shyness in the room. Okay. So we'll run the mic. That's so good. Whenever you're done with your answer and somebody wants yeah. to have a question, just shoot your hand up and then we'll run it to you. Okay. So, so listen, his, his question Are you guys getting my answer? Are you okay with my answer? In other words, you. you uh, you're not compelled to pull everybody on board and especially your leaders and stuff say, hey, you got to do this, listen to this, and tell every testimony of everything that's ever happened when God's moving. They'll, people tend to hear it wrong. They'll read into what you're doing. They'll, they'll think you're boasting in yourself. They'll say, well, now you know it's all, all Jesus, right? They, they could even get religious on you, and that's what you're running into at some level. Look, as soon as you see that, you got to realize where that's coming from. Don't judge them. Just back off and realize, wow. I don't need to broadcast everything God's doing through me in a day. The people that are getting touched is enough. God will multiply it from there. You've got to trust the work of Holy Spirit. So don't be your own broadcaster. And it's not wrong to tell a friend. Or Todd would call me all the time. Dude, you got to check this out. You tell me what God was doing through me. It was all okay and healthy. But if he'd have started doing that to other pastors and leaders in our lives, it might have touched them different. You see what I'm saying? So you have to be careful. Why is it important to tell that certain individual? Why is it important to keep letting someone know? Because they'll start reading into your motive and think you've got some up your sleeve or you're trying to change the church or you're trying to get this doctrine in. You know what I'm saying? And if there's insecurity, you'll locate it quick if you do that. <laughs> so you really don't have to do that. Jesus will bear witness of himself through you if you just live faithful to the truth. All right? Am I making sense? Okay, so don't feel compelled to change anybody's mind or usher anybody in, so to speak. Sounds right, sounds Christian, but I've seen too many people do that. They get overbearing. I'm not saying you are. They, I've known people to get overbearing. They use Todd's name and my name too much. They say, well, Dan says, well, that's not how Dan thinks. And it's like all of a sudden a person resents me and doesn't even know me because they're misrepresenting my own heart. You get what I'm saying? So please don't do that to something that's so good called the gospel. All right? Question? Anybody? What happened to the young lady that was, weren't you in the aisle? Okay, we need to make sure we get, huh? Well, yeah, but we'll get you then. Make sure you don't, I mean, I knew you were standing there. She'll, no, you, she can ask her a question. And we'll get her. Oh, okay, well. I just knew you were there. I'm just being sensitive to the fact that, hey, there's a lady there that's not there. It was you. Uh, I, I have a question that well, I had to. Oh, we'll even give it to you. We will get it back to her. Um, she knows. One that. was that um, when you were talking yesterday about marriages that, or falling in love, that many of us confuse love for actually I needed you in my life. Mm -hmm. And um, I wanted to uh, un understand okay. what is your belief behind the woman's respect your husband and husbands love your wife because As Christ loved the church. Yes. Yeah. Because I felt like I, if I respect him so he feels more valuable himself or if he loves me I feel more valuable as well. So he needs me, and I need him. And then I started wrapping my mind around it, and I got confused. So and then, uh, right. And the other one was that what was for you? I grew up Catholic, Catholic school, so I have heard a million versions of "Take up your cross and follow me." But the "Take up your cross," what that means okay. for you? If, okay. If yeah, I explained that a little bit last night, but I'll gladly explain it because I love explaining that. They are great questions. And do you understand that what she just described in her marriage is what most people have as their reality? So she's like, if he loves me, I feel more valuable. And then, if, if, and then 
we just need each other. And then, and then, but see, that is such a setup. Because in the long run, what it does is it makes you subject to one another and how one another is responding to one another. That's why there's so much heartbreak and devastation in relationships and marriage. Because you're drawing your identity from one another instead of loving one another through a healthy identity. And I'll explain. So, uh, you, you with me? So, so here's what we need to feel needed. We think if we're needed, women really feel strong about this without the truth realigning their heart. They, they literally think, well, if you don't need me, you don't love me. And no, if you love me, you won't ever put the obligation of needing on a person. Like, like when I love you, I don't know nothing but love. My love's never self-serving. It's not demanding anything of you to make me better. My joy is loving you and giving my life to you. And greater love hath no man than this than he laid on his life. A lot of people grow up being trapped in needing to be needed. So they want to be needed because being needed makes them feel useful. So if they're not needed, they don't feel useful. Are you kidding? You can walk in the light as he's in the light. You can shine. You can walk in love. You can make peace. You can show mercy. We just get tricked into needing one individual called spouse to love me, to need me, and that's what raises my value. No, that's what's going to keep you insecure, and you're only being as good as he's needing you. And if he doesn't seem to be needing you, you're falling apart. I don't think he loves me anymore. I wonder if there's somebody else. And now you're in some little soap opera world. Yeah? <laughs> it's really not anything Jesus ever taught us. <laughs> Husbands, submit. Or, or wives, submit to your own husbands as unto the Lord. The word submit doesn't mean you're his slave and he's the boss. The word submit means yield and adapt to your own husband as you would to the Lord. What's your name? Jessica. So Jessica, I'm up now. Your question got me out of my chair. <laughs> That's good. I didn't, did I? This is a good topic. You got me stirred up. So Jessica is reading her Bible. And she's growing spiritually. She's growing the Lord. And all of a sudden, she reads in her Bible some things about her life, some things Jesus is saying. And she's going, whoa, this ain't totally measuring up with me, my conduct and things. And all of a sudden, Jessica says, I love you, Lord. I want to give all my life to you. And she starts to make adjustments and adapt and yield herself to the Lord. He says, you're to yield and adapt yourself to your own husband. So once you get married, you're hanging out together 24-7. Wow, we were dating, we were going out, we were hanging a lot, but now we're living together, we're always together. We are, yeah, yeah. And all of a sudden, months in, next thing you know, it's like, man, I never realized he was quite like that. Or, man, I never realized he had that attitude. I never realized that he was a certain way. And all of a sudden, you're not sure you like that. Or it's, wow, that surprised me. Or, wow, the closer I got to you, I realized there were things about you I didn't really know. What the Lord is saying is, look, as you bump into those things, it doesn't change love. Yield and adapt yourself to your own husband as you yield and adapt yourself to the Lord, as unto the Lord and husbands. See, we have beat this thing to death and we've made the wives subservient to the men. We've made the wives serve the men. If you read scripture, it's really the total opposite. It's wives Yield and adapt yourself to your own husband as you would to the Lord and husbands. And the whole rest of the text down to verse 30 is husbands, 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 husbands. <laughs> He's telling the and there's a reason. Because Adam was here before Eve. God breathed into dirt and Adam stood up. Adam is in the image and fullness of God. Adam is power packed, chock full of God. Adam is love. He's love in the flesh. He's love expressed. He's love exemplified. Adam is like God. Who knows that scripture? God looks out and sees animals and, 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 and he has Adam name everyone. And he doesn't upstage him. He doesn't change his mind. He doesn't laugh and say, you can't call it that. That's silly. If Adam said it, it was so. Why? Because he's functioning in the dominion God gave him. And he's functioning in the wisdom. This man is one with God. Adam is amazing in God. And God looks and says, man, there is none comparable to this man. The animals all have a comparable partner, a helper. There's none comparable. We think, because of the flesh we've lived, we think Adam's lonely. Are you kidding me? He's totally filled with God, complete and content. There's not a vacuum in his life. 
What God is saying is it's not good to smell me alone. There's no one comparable. This revelation can't multiply. It stops with Adam. I made Adam to multiply me. Where does he go from here? Let me make one comparable. He puts Adam in a sleep. He doesn't make another lump of clay. Ladies, you're not a separate lump of clay. Did you say Jennifer, Jessica, and Mary? Okay. So he makes George in his image. I've preached this for years. I say if there's a woman in a man's life scripturally, it ought to be because of the fullness of God in the woman. Because if you read scripture, it shouldn't be because of needy or wow, she's hot. It shouldn't be that. It shouldn't be, well, I'm not getting any younger. You know, I'd like to start a family soon. Hey, he'll do. Come on. If there's a woman in a man's life scripturally, it's because of the fullness of God in a man. The woman never came on the scene until Adam was revealed in the fullness of God. So man was made to love and Adam's love. So the woman was made and brought out the fullness of God in man. So her place in life is to be loved and receive the love of God through her man who's filled with God. So she responds into that love. And because she sees that first love, she loves. And it's so reciprocal and it's so holy and it's so amazing. And it's nothing to do with duty, need, insecurity. It's the most beautiful thing you can see. It's right in the Bible. It's in the beginning. And he said it's the highest expression of God on the earth. When a man leaves his father and mother's mystery, but it's Christ and his church. It's like one plus one is a stronger one. So you've got two wills, two motions, two individuals together for one cause, is it? Or you're here to serve each other and get along and make this thing work and have a few kids and hope it works out and have an IRA when the time comes. Or you're here in the synergism of being one and looking like him in your union. Maybe that's why you're here. Maybe you're not here for the flutters and fillings and the fusses and you fill my gaps and I'll fill you. You do me, I'll do you, we'll be good together. Don't jump ship because I'll fill the water. I bet it was never that way from the beginning. I bet you God reached into Adam and into the fullness of God in the man. He pulled out a woman who was flesh of his flesh, but she's not another lump of clay. She's flesh of his flesh and bone of his bone. He pulled, she pulls her out of him and makes what was one two. It was just one. He reaches in and now one's two. So the two can enjoy one. Synergism. Humble. Submission. Two wills, two emotions, two minds. Coming to, sound like the Godhead at all? Coming together, one. Yeah? Amen. <laughs> Y'all good? So now watch. Wonder if they conceive in that place. Sexuality is a holy thing. I don't have time to go into it all. It's just, it's just so much, and, it's, and I get really graphic, and I'm going, I won't go there today. But it's a holy thing. They're naked, and they don't even understand that. They don't even, there's innocence. They don't even know that. He's not craving her. He's not lusting her. Women are trained to believe that's good. They want to be lusted after. No, you want to be loved like God loves you. You don't want a man to want you. A man can want you because you have the right part. A man can want you because he's needy. Because he has urges. It doesn't mean you're beautiful. It doesn't mean you're special. It might mean he's itchy. It's not a compliment to have a man want you sexually. It's a compliment to have a man want to lay down his life to bring out the best in you and love you with all that he is. That's a compliment. Anybody can want to have an orgasm who's really ready to give you their life. It's not a compliment to have a man want you. It doesn't make you beautiful. It can mean he's needy. If you knew the phrases that men have out there in their little circle, women ought to be in on that. Flies on the wall. Maybe they'd sober up and not be vulnerable. There's a lot of derogatory things out there that men that aren't thinking Jesus said. Using one another for the sake of their own. It's not cool. 
So then you get to reduce this thing. Yeah, man, you can't live with me. You can't live without me. It's not like that. Can't live with me. Can't live without me. I've heard all this. No, no, no. It was none of this was from the beginning. None of this was from the beginning. I mean, even when they're trying to talk to Jesus about divorce and justify their lives, their hard hearts, Jesus says, well, none of this was from the beginning. Moses only gave you a certificate of divorce because of your hard heart. It wasn't this way from the beginning. <laughs> yeah, but he cheated on me. Yeah, but she cheated on me. Well, wonder if you don't let what they did harden your heart and you stay in God and all of a sudden God in you changes them and they would never go there again and now they're redeemed and you're still together and it's never the same. It's always better because heaven's at stake. It sure beats looking for legal reason to move on. <laughs> Jesus calls it the hardness of heart. So... <clears throat> The most beautiful picture is when you two guys value one another to the point where you owe no man anything but to love. So you wake up to just honor him and love him and yield and adapt to him as you would to Jesus. And wives and husbands, you love your wives as he loves his own church. Does he love his church through weaknesses and things that could be different and changed? Is his church perfect? Does he love her perfect? So is it about trying to change her and get her to meet your capacity and your needs? Or is it about loving her in the midst of it all and showing her that she's valued and teaching her what love is through the husband by the Spirit of God? And all of a sudden, the, husband, the wife, circumstantially, functionally, didn't deserve a thing, and all she's getting is love. And all of a sudden, the goodness of God is leading her to change and repentance, and all of a sudden, she's weeping on her bed and thinking, oh my goodness, God, this is how you must love me. And all of a sudden, the husband is teaching her the love of God because the husband's in God's image. <laughs> that sure beats quarrels. <laughs> that sure beats you do for me, I do for you. Come on. Be fruitful, multiply. It's a holy thing. They're naked. They're not ashamed. They're together. He reached into one and made them two so two could be one. So he brought woman out of the fullness of God in man. Be fruitful and multiply. He's not just talking about getting pregnant, guys, and having children. He's talking about multiplying the image and cover the earth with his glory. He's talking about conceiving in this holy place, reproducing after its own kind, each seed, so the whole earth looks like him. Here's what's awesome. Stand up here with me, sister. Please. What's your name? Cynthia. This is Cynthia. My name is Dan. In an hour now, you're not going to say, now are you Dan or are you Cynthia? Because she doesn't look anything like me. And I don't look anything like her. You're not going to confuse us, guys. But watch this. We can both look like him. Oh. Did you get it? Tomorrow, you're not going to come up to me and say, hey, Cynthia. Because I'm Dan, and you know that. We can both look like him. She's her, I'm me. We can both look like him. The unity of faith is right there. That's what unity means. In our diversity, living for the same reason. In our diversity, waking up to the same cause. Oh. Oh, it ain't uniformity. Look, we've blown that. It's unity. Total diversity. One heart. Ooh, thanks. Is that helpful? Yay. So wonder if this room I'm looking at begins to be the steward of their own heart, their own convictions, their own conscience, starts going to bed thinking this way, communing God, waking up thinking this way, and stewarding their lives in this truth so grace abounds, and all of us are alive for one reason. Oh, yeah, you might do this as a job. You might do this. You might have this work schedule. You might drive this. You might like this music. You might, but we all wake up for his image and blood. That's what makes us one. And I promise you that's what he shed his blood for. Not to take you to heaven someday. To make you like him. And to put who he is inside of you. So together we express the fullness of heavenly things. That's your birthright and his birthday. And you can make it something else if you want. But if you read scripture, that's why he died. 
Yeah. So, yeah. Women, for some reason, I'm not being hard on the women. I usually favor the women in, 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 in some things because you've gotten a, a tough and bad rap. And I've been a guy, so I understand that angle, and it, it grieves my heart. I'll get crying real quick when I think about you girls and the pressure you're under to look a certain way, to be a certain way, that grade that's been set. Because, listen, let's just be real and talk openly. If you don't genetically qualify, then what? It's such a lie that you have to be something the world says to be a woman. It's a ridiculous lie. But thousands of women get swallowed up by it constantly. It's not wrong to look nice. It's not wrong to look nice. But please don't make that what matters most. What matters most is who you are and that who you are looks like him. Even the Bible says, don't let it be the adorning and the outward and the hair. And the heart. Let it be that gentle, quiet, inward person in your heart that just really pleases him. God. Yeah. Y'all good with that? So the needy thing, I challenge everybody to get a grip on that. Please don't say, well, I need him to need me. It's called a codependent lie. You're forcing your husband to be something in your life, to fulfill something that only he has been truly accomplished. Love gives. Love serves. Love doesn't request a man to need. Love is outward. Love doesn't seek its own. We're very self-focused in our relationships if we don't have each other. You hearing what I'm saying? So the things that we grew up with, the emotions, there's a lot of psychology wrapped around it. It never came from the truth. It came from our human experiences. So we diagnosed and studied a fallen man and said, this is who we are. But yet Jesus is saying, follow me. I think I'm going to jump over here and get in his river. The water's better. Yeah? <laughs> follow me. We've studied a fallen man and said, this is us. Jesus said, follow me. Carry your cross, very simple. Never let sin against you give the right to pursue to produce sin in you. Don't let what you're going through define who you are. You are what you are through Jesus. Things are unfair. Don't act like you're treated unfair. Things are unjust. Don't become the expression of injustice. <laughs> There's this song out there that worship singers sing that I really like, and it's talk about dancing on the streets of injustice and Things, what's that mean to dance on injustice? To not let injustice decide who you are and how you are. That's how you dance on injustice. You're not stomping it out with a ritual or a dance. What you're saying is, I haven't lost my joy in the face of what's not fair. I haven't lost the truth in the face of many lies. My disposition hasn't changed because of outward life, because there's true life inside of me. It's carrying the cross. Did Jesus get treated right? Quite the opposite. No one's ever been treated more wrong than Jesus. Would you agree that there was never a greater act of injustice than the cross? Who deserved less ever than Jesus to die? And yet he died. Right? Like, super unjust. Did all that injustice change who he was? Did all the gossip, the presumption, and the bad things, in the midst of healing folks and raising the dead, they had a lot to say. They'd get in their little tangents and meetings, and he's a demon, says Samaritan. He's a blasphemer. He says he comes from God. Well, we watched Mary raise him. How can he say he came from God? He grew up with us. All this stuff going on. Did he ever let that change his good? Were men able to change who he was? That's why he's still able to change men. That's why he has that power. Because he's, that's carrying the cross. He's telling us to carry ours. Did he deserve the cross? Love chose to hang there. You getting what I'm saying? Was he treated right? Had nothing to do with his good. He's good because he's good. He's not good because they treated him right. He's good because he's good. Are you guys getting this? It's so simple that sometimes it's like people go, it can't be this simple. Oh, it's so simple. Jesus modeled the life we're created for and said, follow me. 
He didn't say, sing to me and pray to me when you're overwhelmed. He said, follow me, become like me, and I'll give you my spirit to help you do that and empower you to do that. Look, if you couldn't follow Jesus, he wouldn't ask you to. We've religiously turned it into a prayer and service within the church body. Instead of a life that looks like him. You with me? So watch this. My wife knows that I don't need her. It doesn't make her insecure. It actually makes her free because she's not under the pressure of fulfilling me. She doesn't have to perform for me. She doesn't have to do anything for me. So she doesn't even owe me a thank you. She doesn't have to say one nice thing to me. I love being who I am in Jesus, and I love loving her, and it's a joy being alive. Yay. So when she does something nice for me, it's so healthy because it's never meeting a need. It's not because, whew, I'm glad she did that. I was beginning to worry how she saw me. Come on. So if she makes me, I was just telling them at lunch how sweet she is to me. I'll pull up in the driveway. I don't expect one thing out of her, and she lays down her life for me. Why? Because I expect nothing of her. So she's free and released to bless me and give me her whole heart because not one bit of it's obligatory. Are you following me? So she knows I like something. She knows something will be special. She has her habit sitting. I'll walk in the house and just right there on the table sitting there, and she'll say, I thought she really liked that. And I'm like, you are so amazing. I just wanted to bless you so much. She is. Watch. If that wasn't laying there, everything's the same. So now that it's laying there, I can receive it. It's actually sweet. It touches my heart. It's healthy because I don't need her to do that to affirm anything. It's just, I love you. Yay, it's so clean. See, most of us get caught up in the feeling, gushy, emotional stuff. I don't, I don't but there's a kickback. There's a feedback. Do you know this? Pastors will know this. They've experienced this. There's people that will serve in the church, and they're not serving in the church because they love God and the kingdom of God. They're serving in the church because they get recognition for it, and they get acknowledged for it, and sometimes honored for it. So they go out of their way, to serve even more. And people say, oh my goodness, you're the servant of the year. I don't know what we'd do without you. You are so from heaven. There is no one like you. Those lyrics belong to someone else. <laughs> so then they're just... <sighs> yeah. And you come up to them and say, you are so amazing. They say, excuse me. And they heard you. You're so amazing. Oh, oh. Well, it's all the Lord. <laughs> be, honest, be honest with me if I have pastors or leaders here. There has been more hurt in people serving like that who didn't get the due they thought they deserved, so they moved on because people didn't appreciate them. And if you're serving in the ministry to be appreciated, it can't be love. It's twisted back out till you get your heart right. All you're doing is filling gaps and living lies. You do not serve in a ministry to be appreciated and acknowledged. You serve in a ministry because you understand the value of the people, family, God, the kingdom of God, the need there, and you're willing to lay down your life and time with nothing in return because that's love. It's not a place you can ever get hurt. It's a place you serve. And you never need acknowledged for it. I've told people my whole Christian life, and, and, it, and it's funny because people say, oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. And I'm like, I've sacrificed nothing in my life. It was so easy to come down here. You say, thank you for coming. Okay, praise God. I understand what you're saying. Well, I'm a sacrifice. I'm glad to be here. I'm having a blast meeting new people and fellowship. And I'm just having fun. Does it look like I'm sacrificing? <laughs> I don't need a thank you. So when they say thank you, I can receive it. It can be healthy. But if I came down here for the thank you, that's setting me up for trouble because if you don't thank me like I think you should and I don't get what I feel like I'm due, now I get hard towards the people. Now I'm trying to cattle whip and sheep beat and try to get people to be what I needed to be. And all of a sudden my motive's all twisted up. You follow me? Carry your cross. You taxi through every situation. And never let that situation have a voice in who you are and what you portray to be. You let Jesus have that all in the settle. Because if you deny yourself, get up. And you pick up your cross. Now you're following him. You get it? Because he had denied himself. 
laid down his glory, made himself vile. No reputation. Be honest. Seeking reputation our whole life. Seeking to be noticed. Seeking to be known. We've been trapped seeking reputation and we're to arm ourselves and have the same mind in us that was also in them who made himself of none. Do you see how opposite the kingdom is from what you were trained by? Life says, well, it'd be great if it would happen, but if I were you, I wouldn't get my hopes up. You ever hear it? The Bible says, get your hope up. Face the substance of things hope for. Hope stands for your soul. It passes through the veil into his presence. Hope is a big deal. Get your hope up. Yeah? Well, what you don't know. Well, what? You all heard that down here? Down here in Houston. They talk like it. What you don't know won't hurt you. You've heard that? The Bible says what you don't know is destroying you. And you grew up with a language that says what you don't know won't hurt you to make you passive and act like. Who's ever heard this? Well, what you see is that language made it all the way down here. They've been talking that up in PA for my whole life. How to get down here? It's a universal language. It's called the spirit of this age and the wisdom of this world. And it says, hey, what you see is what you get. But if you read your Bible in 2 Corinthians 4, it says, don't you ever live by what you see? Because what you see is subject to change. Only the unseen things are eternal. And yet you're here and what you see is what you get. What a fat lie. Well, each to his own. Well, the Lord helps those who help themselves. There is so many phrases. I was teaching this in a church a while back, and I said, start giving me some phrases you grew up with that you know now that you know the word are totally opposite. You should have heard the stuff they were saying. I was like, wow, there's a ton of them. The language we grew up with and the mentality we grew up with is perverted 180 degrees from the truth. Watch this. There's no selfishness in love and there's no love in selfishness. And the goal of our instruction is love. And there's none of the same in either. No love in selfishness, no selfishness in love. So that means we're growing to be one or the other. See, we don't like that. We think that sounds rigid. What a gift that I can get out of me and into him. I'm not talking about failure. I'm talking about becoming. I'm not talking about missing it. I'm talking about becoming. I can pursue to become love and get every trace and motive of selfishness rooted out of my life by the understanding of truth and I can actually be formed in love because the goal of our instruction is love and love doesn't seek its own. Sounds like a kingdom day to me. Sounds like you'll be fulfilled in that place and love's your only response. And all of a sudden, you're not trying to accommodate one another. You just value one another, and it's all given. It just all happens. It's your expression. I value my wife. Obviously, I'm going to love her and show the expression of love. Yeah? Here's what my wife likes about me. She can't let me down, fail me, or break my heart. It's totally impossible. Because I don't live for her to love me. I live to love. It's a totally big difference. Before Jesus... She owed me big time and could never pay up. <laughs> I'm just telling you. But now that Jesus come, I went, whoa, duh. And everything changed. So my wife, she understands that now. Yeah. My whole sexual view, everything changed, you know. Women think they'd be flattered if their husband would chase them around the house. Yeah, until the day you don't feel like they chase them. So it's a compliment on one day, and now it's a burden on another. Now they've been treating me nice, so I need to reward them. And all of a sudden, the whole sexual expression is obligatory. Well, they are men. They do have means. And they're feeling it. But I am a man. I am his wife. And my Okay, honey. That gets old after a while, and that produces bad things. It does. Nobody likes talking about it. This is true. So my wife said to me one day, she said, you know what I realized? She said, if something happened to me, I could never come together with you in that way again or anything. You'd be totally fine. You wouldn't need a woman. I said, I'm not needing men anymore. I'm so fulfilled in Christ. It's ridiculous to love me as an honor and be loved and love with me. It's a privilege. It's an honor. It's not a need. It's not in that. And people are like, what? But my 
wife understands because she lives with me. And she realizes I'm not pushing myself on her and saying, hey, honey, it's been like three days, maybe even four. Come on. It's love. So guess what happened to my wife when she realized that? She enjoyed all the more being together that way. And she, so she begins to initiate and do things. And all of a sudden, it's her responding to love. It doesn't make her needy. It means she recognizes love and feels safe in that place. And all of a sudden, it becomes holy. And God's there. Oh, Okay, I'm done talking about all that. Don't you ask me any more questions. Who gave her the mic anyway? No, <laughs> that's good. That's good. <laughs> Long answers, huh? This marriage one, you can talk about it all day. You can do a whole seminar on the thing. That's just, that's just understand that you, you find yourself in Jesus, you become one in Christ, you become complete in Christ, and now you're ready to love. Now I'm ready for relationship. Look, if I see myself in him and see who I've become in him, now I'm finally positioned to love you, never need you. Come on, if I go to church with you guys and I lived here and I needed you to do something to be sure that I'm okay, then I'm only as good as you're fulfilling that. That's idolatry. Come on, I'm going to find myself in weakness. And it's going to be your fault. And then when I hear your name, the only thing I think about is what you didn't fulfill. Are you getting this? Look, I just met Pastor this weekend. So say I lived here and I moved down here and we got hanging out and we're just hanging out together. And all of a sudden I have just some unspoken expectations and I'm just assuming. And, and all of a sudden he doesn't fulfill some of those things. It happens to people. And, it, and then they get taken back. Well, I can't believe he did that. Well, I thought better of him. Well, I didn't imagine he'd ever. Next thing you know, I have a skewed view. And now I'm feeling a little, now I don't know if I want to even trust him. And I, I'm like, what is that? That's not Jesus. There are unspoken expectations. You've got to let them go. They bring bad things. Expectations like that. Come on, you wake up to love, period. No one owes you a thing. You owe no man anything but to love. Read your Bible. <laughs> How else would you overcome evil with good? If you have to be a product of evil, you can never overcome it with good. You have to be the product of it. So I guess you should be the product of what's good so you can overcome with good and never be the product of evil. Carry your cross. You guys get that? Okay, I know I'm being a little redundant and I'm going over and over. It just needs to stick. Because we've been taught by a lot of things that aren't true. And our emotions agree with those things because we believe those things. And it's a vicious cycle of expression. Yeah? Hope deferred makes the heart sick. Everybody quotes that when they're down and out. You show me where that scripture says you have to let your hope be deferred. It says if your hope's deferred, your heart will get sick, but it tells you to never let go of your hope all through scripture. So what's it doing deferred? Get your eyes back on truth. Stop feeling sorry for yourself. Get a bigger dream. <laughs> Are you guys okay? <laughs> or did I eat too much Vietnamese food? It's making me a certain way. No. <laughs> Are we okay? Anybody have another question? Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, the lady we ripped the mic from. My question's on healing. Um, I've been struggling with getting a full healing. Like, I'll be prayed for, and I know that I've been healed. I know that I know that I know. I felt something in me that was healed, and I'll wake up the next day, and I'm not healed. And I I know, and it's a little thing. It's a little thing. It's so easy for God to just heal anything, but it's right. not like it's a major issue. Right. Like I have a sprained ankle and a heel spur, and I know that I've been healed from both, but the manifestation won't come. Okay. But I believe. Okay. I believe, and I have the faith in it, and I'm walking my faith. That's excellent. It's a loaded question. We can talk all day on this one, but I'm going to just try to stick with your question and answer this. A lot of us have had situations we've been prayed for and we don't see it change or totally change. Time goes by. What you have to make sure is that time doesn't change you. Here's the deal. Truth is never subject to time. Truth's going to be the same forever. So what happens to us is we don't realize we start subtly identifying with what hasn't changed. All of a sudden, we get more questions than we have answers. And all of a sudden, we're living from the place of quandary. 
And, and I'm not saying you're doing this. I'm saying this is what I've seen happen in the way of healing a lot. So when this sister's saying, I got this, I got this, I know Jesus. So technically, principally, scripturally, you have you see this is God's will and this is not a big deal for God, right? So you got to hold on to that no matter how this seems and not let that frustrate you that it didn't change and get question driven. I got to be, here's what some people, well, I got to be doing something wrong or it would be changed by now because it's just got, it's so easy for God. There's got to be something blocking. And then they go on this deep soul search and throw their identity on the chopping block. The most important thing to do is maintain and establish and lock in your identity in that situation. To where you know who you are through who he is. You know his will. Faith comes when the will of God is known. And all of a sudden it works through love. And all of a sudden you stand in relationship and stand in position of what you know is true. And you don't let symptoms, circumstances, pain, or time change that truth. And you stay there till that truth overtakes everything and brings even a greater revelation to your heart. So here's what that looks like. You got prayed for. Wow, it feels good. You wake up in the morning. There it is again. After three times of that, your mind starts trying to get trained into going, you got to be kidding me. What is going on? This should not be. And now you're just frustrated. No, no, no. As soon as you recognize that, Father, I thank you. Your love is unstoppable. You're laying in your bed. You're just feeling that thing in your heel, just rolling your foot around. You're like, Father, I just thank you. Your love's unstoppable. I know what you've done through your son, and I know last night what you did in my body, and I thank you all this day. I'm walking in that freedom. God, your love is amazing for me. I am in you, and you're in me. You see me blameless, holy, above reproach, and God, I receive your love. And all of a sudden, you're just reestablishing, affirming, and nailing down your relationship in his will to restore and heal all things. And you get up, and you go right to the bathroom, and you walk through day. That thing's trying to hurt you. Father, I just thank you. You make sure because of this perception you're shining all day, you're productive, and you aren't slipping into, okay, now what's going on with this foot, and why ain't it getting healed? And then all of a sudden you backtrack and you're looking into closets, doors, and things, and it just, I've never seen anyone do well when they respond that way, ever. But when they continue in him and let faith remain faith and truth remain truth in the face of time, I've seen tons of things change. I've seen people build in their integrity. They get locked in. They become no nonsense. And they know what they know when they know. Follow what I'm saying? So that's my encouragement to you. Don't soul search. Don't think, watch this. Watch. I'm not challenging you. Do you have a relationship with Holy Spirit? I believe he loves you? So is he playing charades? Or do you think that in your relationship, he would tell you something if you're missing something? Don't you think he'd reveal something to you if you if there was something blocking and you said, Lord, whatever there is that I would need to, I'm so ready to yield. I just want to walk out. Do you think he's playing charades or do you think in relationship, Holy Spirit say, well, you know, I am. Wouldn't he do that? Of course he would. We forget all that. and We go searching and do this big soul search. There's countless ministries out there that say they're set up to help you with that process. I've never seen good come out of those things. People lose their identity in that. They become a person with a problem instead of a person with a covenant. And then all of a sudden, the whole idea that their foot's not healed is ruling their everyday, their identity, and their output. It's not cool. Listen, my mother had sickness for 40 years. I've seen countless people heal. I promise. And I didn't see my mama heal. It was so in my face my whole life. It was one of the biggest challenges of my life. So don't tell me I don't understand this stuff. I carried her to bed at night. I changed her pants when I was a young man. Don't tell me I don't understand. But none of my mom's situation changes what this book says. None of it rewrites Jesus' life. i got to stay locked on Jesus' life because that's what changes these things. But if I keep rewriting the book every time I have a contrary experience, I'll never come to the knowledge of truth. I'll just toss around a lot of theological thought. Yeah? So when my mom passes away, am I mad at the gospel? Why God? How God? No. Wow, thank you for the blood, Jesus. Man, I know I feel in some sense like we lost, but I know we won. Mom's alive forevermore in you, and if it wasn't for the blood, it'd be a total write-off. And what a bummer. God, I feel like she got robbed so many years, but the truth is you redeemed her life forever. So God, I'm going to press on and keep praying for the sick and move forward and be inspired by your great love. Five months after my mother died, I saw somebody healed of the same disease who hadn't walked for five and a half years, get up and walk out of this church. Why? Because I want to take mom's death personal. I already took the gospel personal. I won't write my theology to suit my mother's situation. 
have already got healthy theology. It's called the life of Jesus Christ. <laughs> Yay. And I can't get offended and mad and cover my mother over him because I already laid down my life. I love it not unto death. So I love less my mother, father, and all that stuff. doesn't mean you disregard them. It means you raise the gospel higher. So even what I believe or I'm in faith, keep believing, keep pursuing, keep going after faith. But here's the truth. The Bible says, if you have faith, you say the mountain, the mountain will move, right? So is the evidence of faith the mountain moving or speaking to the mountain? Mountain moving. We're speaking to tons of mountains. Keep your faith. Don't let time decide. Don't get all this other stuff. Just stay where you're at. Know his love. See his will through Jesus. And believe his love. And stay where you are until that revelation gets so big the mountain doesn't have a chance to move. Yeah? Yeah. I've had people come to me and they say, but I believe. And they're, they're mad. I said, well, first of all, you're really frustrated and understand because you have physical loss, personal loss, and you're hurting your heart. But listen, you're challenging God. What you're saying is he's unfaithful, he's not true. You believe, and the mountain didn't move. It's not true. You didn't want him to die. You love him. You prayed sincere. You might have been moved by the fear of death. You might have been moved by the sense of loss. You might have been moved because somebody else died, and you thought, here we go again. There's a lot of things that moves our hearts, guys. Just because we're praying, it doesn't mean there's faith. Sometimes it's the total opposite. It's the fear of death. It's frustration. It's worry. It's sentiment. I don't want to lose them. And all of a sudden, the whole motive of praying is the fear of death instead of the promise of life. You follow what I'm saying? See, just because we pray doesn't mean it's faith. Just because we understand spiritual principles doesn't mean it's faith. There's something about my heart seed. So I pursue faith, and I'm not correcting her for saying, but I believe, because I believe you do. You understand your covenant. You understand God's heart through Scripture that this thing should lead your life. That's what you're saying. You stay right there, because I agree with you. You say, well, why isn't it? How come? And people just, people that aren't doing well in their everyday lives. I promise you, being analytical is not a gift from God. No, it's not. <laughs> I didn't say an I, high IQ is not a gift from God. I said being analytical. You say, well, God made me this way. No, no, no. God never gave you the ability to talk yourself out of him. That happened in the garden when they listened to another voice. Yeah. God never gave man the gift of talking himself out of God. Y'all good? Making me think, man. Anybody else have a question? Did, are we okay? Did we answer that somewhat? So relationship. Continue in relationship. Let God's love be predominant in your life. And Father, you're the one that makes all things new. God, I so understand and believe that you took away every weakness, every infirmity, that this foot, this heel, this spur can't remain. You love me so much. Jesus, what you did is awesome. Thank you. You reach down, you grab your ankle, your calf, your foot, whatever you want to do. You be whole, you be healed, you serve today, you walk, you do well. In Jesus' name. Two times in my life I've been jogging, and while I was jogging, I felt my knee just pop. It was crazy. The first time I just I just kept running, and it hurt, but I kept running. And I said, thank you, Father. God, I thank you. You gave me two knees, and I thank you. You gave me those knees to work and carry me all the days of my life. And I started to proclaim what I believed about my creative value. Next thing you know, it was like a Rocky movie. I was like, Doo -doo 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 -doo. Was just, it was awesome. The second time it popped, I pulled up like a lame horse. You know what I mean? And I stopped, and I prayed over my knee right on the street. And it felt like I couldn't walk or run. Something just went pop, and it hurt. And I prayed for my knee, and I looked up, and I said, okay. And I just took off. I'm not telling you to do that. I did that. Because I wanted to do that. I'm okay doing that. I'm not telling you to do that. I did that. I took off about four steps in. Rocky movie. Totally normal. First three steps. Wow. Fourth step. Bam. See? Now if you do that because I did that, your fifth step, you're wondering where the wow is. <laughs> see, you don't do it as a method. You do it because it's what you see. 
It's not about human wisdom. Well, brother, you need to use wisdom. You could add a tear and made it even worse. See, you're on a totally different page and in a different book than I am. So we can't really have a communication thing because you're going to offend it with me and you're going to try to change me and tell me to use wisdom, but it's not the wisdom I'm living from. So it's a dead-end street. No sense to even go there. Because I don't understand your language, even though I do. I don't live from it. So if I'm okay taking those steps, probably ought to just leave me alone. Because I'm doing okay. Yeah? It was sure a little better than surgery and rehab and still limping and reconstructive and all whatever else is out there. I'm just going this way. And if some reason I'd have had to go the other way, I'm not demeaning the other way. I'm just this. That's what I do. I'm a gospel guy. And I hardly preach this stuff from the pulpit because people go try to do what I do instead of see what I've seen and become what I'm becoming. It's not because I'm super spiritual. It's because I see something. It's the something I get. It's something I understand. So because of that, I'm going to do that. Are you following me? It's not a method. I'm not testing God. I'm not saying, okay, this is going to be faith. I'm hurting, but I'm going to run. It's going to be my faith. <laughs> that would not be happy. <laughs> I did that once. I ran up and down the stairs twice with the knee that was tore up from work. I shared that testimony with a doctor here when we went down. But I thought it was a macho pride that came in my heart. I was the oldest man in the warehouse. My hair was gray. And the guys called me Grandpa. That day, I tore my knee. You don't realize this macho stuff creeps in where you feel like you still need to show some young guy, I can perform, I can outwork you, I can still lift weight, I can still run, I can, you know, it's just weird. Like you get a kid on a basketball court, he's 50, 18 years younger than you, you just want to beat him, you know what I mean? You just want to stuff his shot, man, and you just want to turn around and shoot a jumper right on him, you know what I'm saying? It's just a weird, it's a macho thing, there's a pride there. And I'm at work, and I'm working, and the day I tore my knee, I grabbed about 50 pounds. I'm hurrying. I reached in and my shoe went in between two skidboards. I grabbed the 50 pounds and my leg didn't come with me. Yeah, oh, it was bad. So I pulled my knee out. Well, I'm, I'm a fighter, man. I'm a faith. I'm a, you have no idea, actually. I come across all nice to you because you're not the devil. So, <laughs> so I'm like in this warfare at work, like, I thank you, Father. My knee is hurting. It's messed up. And I'm working. Thank you, God. I'm praying. Shit, katabakasa. Father, I thank you. And I'm just all day. At the end of the day, guess what happened? I set the warehouse record and pulled more than anyone ever had employed by that company. In one day, in an eight-hour day, a 10-hour day, I pulled more and put more output on the day my knee was tore. I put more output than anyone ever on any day. Why? Because of the warfare. Because I'm locked. God. So they come up to me and said, how did you pull that much? And I said, well, someday when you're a grandpa, you'll understand. <laughs> the weirdest, dumbest answer. I mean, I should have said, well, actually, guys, because I was pouring into them, teaching them. They love me. I'm handing out CDs. These guys love me. I'm getting words of knowledge for coworkers. I'm watching forklift drivers cry on the job. I'm telling you. Two supervisors transformed, man. Jesus rocking their world. Words of knowledge, crisp, like supervisor. Hey, man, what's going on? You're not doing well. What do you mean? You're in a deep depression. You haven't slept for weeks. You're suicidal. You're going to quit your job and move back to New York. You're thinking suicide? He is freaked out and trembling. Why? He said, spot on. He was the one that mocked me the most in the whole warehouse and made fun of me openly. So for that man, I got the most rocking word in the book. Trembling. He said, I think we need to talk. I said, I think we do. He left work. He was so shook up. He went to his apartment and said, would you come to my apartment after your shift? I said, I would be honored. He showed me his address. I wrote it down. I knew where I was going. Showed up at his house. Knock, knock, knock. I went in. Talked to him and told him about Jesus. He cried and said, that's the most beautiful thing I've ever heard. I was mocking what I never understood. I said, come on, man, receive it. I want it. Jesus comes. The guy's knocked out on his couch. I ain't kidding. He's... I said, well, he don't need me here. You're going to take good care of this man. And I headed on home. 
Next day, I come home from church. Phone machines flashing. Dan, this is Chris. Oh, my gosh, Dan. I just want to thank you for Jesus. Oh, I start crying. He says, peace. 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 Like three times. He's, peace. He said, I never knew there was such a thing as this peace. Dan, I slept all night. I just woke up since you, whenever you left, I just woke up. I, oh my gosh, Dan, I can't wait to see you at work. Thank you for your Jesus. And I'm like, Ooh. so as soon as it went over, I hit repeat. Just tortured my emotions three times. <laughs> By the third time, I'm like, <laughs> so powerful. Well, I guess you could be offended at him. I guess you'd be like, wow, what a jerk. He's always mocking me. He don't know nothing. Here he is so lost. He's making fun of me. And I'm the one that screamed. Why is he always got to try to upstate? He's so insecure. And all of a sudden, you get your eyes on what's wrong with him. Something's wrong with you. You get it? He is never my problem, never my enemy. Jesus loves him. And the Jesus in me wants to reach him. So when he walks by me, snippy and snide, hello, Dan. I said, hey, man, how are you? He said, I'm good. And the Holy Spirit said, no, he's not. Bam. I said, hey. Called him on it. He went, how do you know that? He asked me if it shows. I said, no, the church has a word called hypocrite. I said, it means a game player, a mask wearer. I said, you're doing a great job, man. He said, watch. This is phenomenal what he did. Because he mocked me all the time, openly. He'd walk through group meetings and go, hallelujah, boys. Amen, brother, brothers. And he'd laugh and chuckle and walk through. Like he's hurting me. I'm hearing God's voice. I'm sleeping all night. I have peace. And he's mocking me and I'm losing? Are you kidding me? <laughs> he said, does it show? I said, no, actually, I thought about hypocrite. He said, well, then how could you? Know? And when he said, no, it hit him. The one he mocked. How could you know? And he froze in mid-sentence. And I looked at him and said, yeah. Um, the one you've mocked in heaven heard you. He loves you, by the way. And he showed me this just yesterday. I think we need to talk. I said, I think we do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> do you want to know how I got hired there? I, I left pastoring to go there because I wanted to get around the darkest place I could find. Full-time pastor, salary. They matched my wages of 15 years, Teamsters Union, when they brought me in pastor. We're not asking you to sacrifice. We're blessing you. We don't want you to give up anything. We will match what you were. Pretty amazing. Two years in, I was a little antsy. Church felt like a business to me at times. I struggled with some things about ministry, and I was searching. I didn't know who to talk to because I didn't trust the answers I'd get. I wasn't sure what to do. So I thought, you know what? I'm comfortable in darkness. I do very well in darkness because light is greater. I'm comfortable around sinful atmospheres. It doesn't gross me out. It doesn't wear me down. It actually helps me shine. Like I really, I do good when people don't understand because I can send a message. So I thought, I got an idea. Let me just step down from passion, give back my salary, and I'll just go find some dark warehouse that I can be in and manifest and shine and love people and work with my hands. And I'll work this out with ministry. I'll, I'll work it out. So I gave my resignation and stuff. And uh, I was going to go get hired this place that's hiring everybody. So I went in there, and there I went to work. And the human resource guy, precious black man, shiny bald head, man. It was shining. I don't know if they rub stuff on there. I don't know. It was just, he, I thought, man, he'd make a good Christian. It's like the glory of God. <laughs> hey, this is exactly how it went down. He's sitting there talking to me. We're doing the interview, and he's asking me all these questions, and we're chatting. And he has two questions left, and he said, okay, Dan, here's what I need from you, man. I said, what is it? He said, I need you to answer these last two questions. Leave out your faith, quit preaching to me, and stop mentioning Jesus. I said, man, is that what you think I'm preaching to you? I can get out of saying that. I, but man, you don't understand. It's my life. I, I'm not pre Oh, come on. Don't tell me you can't answer these two questions without implementing your faith. 
I said, sir, you're taking me back on that. That's teaching me how people think, how I'm wrong. He said, I'm not even going to hang out with you. It's my life. It's my relationship. I don't serve a doctor. And I know him. He's a disciple. He's part of me who won. So, oh, well, you can't tell me that you can't answer these two questions and leave out Jesus. I said, actually, no, I, I don't think I could do that, sir. In fact, I'll tell you what we're going to do. He said, just what I did. I'm forthright. I'm pretty. If Jesus comes on me, you're in trouble. Because I just shut the folder. He's the HR guy. I'm interviewing. I shut the folder and I said, I'll tell you what we're going to do, Bill. We're just going to forget the surgery. How about it? Because this is what I see. Three years ago, you turned your heart from God. And you've allowed some things to be in your life. And it's wrecking your family. And your kids are affected. And your marriage is about to sinker. So what do you say? It's time I stood up. I'm coming over the table now. Because we just unhooked the leash. And I'm coming. I'm going to crawl over the table. And lay hands on him and yell fire. That's what I'm going to do. And it's going to come. I'm just telling you. And I'm on the table, and he's shaking, and he says, no, man, look, back off, back off. And I'm like, <laughs> and there's no shock collar boundary now. I'm, I'm going. And it's very rare to get me off and get me back on. So I'm figuring he's getting bit. I'm getting him. <laughs> right? And it was, it was loving. It was for him. And I said, no, man, listen, it's time to come home. What are you thinking? It's time. He says, look, man, we're in this glass office. You're going to get me in trouble. i got bosses everywhere. You can't be praying for me. I said, come on, man, what are you running from? I said, I'm And I'm up on the table, and for some reason, I backed off. And I said, okay, listen, man, I'm not, I'm not going to push you here. Actually, I need to click back up. This is what I do. My folder's there. He's the HR guy. We have two questions left. I said, everything I said is true, and you know it. He's like that. He said, what do you think, man? God loves you. I don't even think I could break this thing. If you could show. It's like a chess game, your move. I'm not overkilling. I'm not trying to lead him in some prayer, shaka baka, right? Just <laughs> come home to him, Bill. You give him the goods. Bzoop, you call him right where he's at. Bam! And you look him right in the eyes. Come home to him, man. And your tears are in your eyes. And you walk out of his office. That's powerful. So I get home. I get in my car, and I'm like, that was my interview. It was so powerful. You think you're ready for that stuff. But every time God does something dramatic like that, you're not ready for it. It's like, whoa. You got, you got to calm down. You're like, you know what I mean? It's just powerful. And you're rehashing it. And you're like, God, you're amazing. And the reverence of God increases and all this stuff. So I get in my car and I'm like, and then I thought, I wanted that job. That was my interview, Lord. Okay, well, at least we love Don Bill. Somebody else will hire me. So I just figured I'll have to go get another job. So I drove home. I get home. He's got a voicemail on the message machine. Hey, this is Bill. Out it. I know we ended kind of abruptly and unusually. <laughs> but I've decided we're going to hire you. I have you set up for your physical and your orientation is be there, et cetera, et cetera. I hadn't seen Bill, went some orientation, had a real fun time, I had to stand up and tell a little about myself. Everybody treated me like I had leprosy because I'm in love with Jesus. When they picked teams, every time I wasn't on somebody's team, the team celebrated because it wasn't me. The team I got picked on, they were all mocking and going, oh, you got in. Turned out when I left there, they all cried and didn't want me to leave. They said, what are we going to do without you? When I left there, they had a floor meeting and acknowledged that it was my last day so everybody could say their respects and bye. They said, because this man has meant so much to this company, and we appreciate you all. They often said, if we could fill the warehouse with men like this, it would be a company's dream come true. I was getting a little uncomfortable. The Holy Spirit says, stop being uncomfortable. They're honoring you. And I went, whoa. <laughs> I went to work and a Spanish man, very short man, crawled up on my battery jack and stood up. He kept saying, you a good man. I said, you don't understand. 
before Jesus, I wasn't a good man. You, you don't understand. And his language was bothering me. And he's so aggressive and he climbs up on my jack. He says, no, no, no. You good man. He said, I meet some good men in my life. And then I meet some good men in my life. But you, sir. And he's standing right. He says, you a good man. <laughs> I'm like, get down off of my jack. <laughs> I'm working there for two months. Two months. I'm out on the floor. I'm zipping and moving. It's a hard working job. I hear my name on the intercom calling me to these cubicles to these new offices. The number I wasn't familiar with. It was all new. I headed back there. I wasn't sure I was going. My boss was there. I said, did they call me off the floor? He's a little irritated. He said, I don't know why they're calling you off the floor. They got to know you're out here on an incentive review team. I don't know what they want. Make it quick. I said, you know, I'll, I'll make it quick. I'll make up for it. It's all right. He said, I think it's just back the hall. And down. So I had the number in my mind, and I turned, and I was reading it through. And so I go there, and I get to the door number, and it's, 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 it's closed, but it's not latched. You know what I mean? Like the door's not open, but it's open. So I held the knob and tapped. Second time. There's Bill. Standing on the steps like this. Standing at the corner of the desk, trembling, sweat pouring down his face and neck. Two months after our interview, I said, Bill, are you okay? What's going on? I need to come home. You help me come home. <sighs> Lord Jesus, if he touched anything unclean, if he's defiled him, so would you wash him in your holy blood? He's done. He's on the floor. I'm just telling you. Done. And I'm crying. And I just... Oh, left him there. He don't need me. He's in good hands. And it ain't all state. <laughs> He's just laying there scratching fleas. <laughs> it's so good, man. So I ran over to Human Resources, the head lady. She, see, years ago, I'd have been bothered by this. I've had this a couple times in my life. She came up to me after I was working there for about a week. She came out on the floor and met me, and she cried. And I said, well, hey. She cried and said, wow, you're the one. That was so one to me. People are really talking. I said, yeah, they're talking, huh? I said, oh, it's so good. She started crying. She said, you are the answer to my prayer. I said, what do you mean, honey? She said, I have such a heart for this warehouse and these people. And I'm in human resources, so I have certain access, but I'm not on the floor. And I've been praying, Jesus, would you please come to this warehouse? Jesus, would you please come to this warehouse? She looked at me right in the eyes and said, you the answer to my prayer. I said, he's here. <laughs> I was in an airplane. Ladies trembling. I said, it's okay, honey. We need to pray. Are you okay? I'm so overwhelmed. I said, it's okay. We're just going to pray. I, I feel like I'm talking to Jesus. I said, you are. He lives in me. <laughs> Years ago, I'd have probably been a little freaked out by that. We probably thought it was some form of heresy. Now I understand it's Christ in me, the hope of glory. And Christ in you, and Christ in me, and Christ in you, and Christ in you, and Christ in you, and probably multiplies the glory. <laughs> yeah. So for, I went into I went into her, I said, hey, check on Bill in a little while, because he was. I said, uh, he's just come home. She just starts bawling profusely. What a heart. What a caring heart for people. She starts bawling instantly. Oh! I said, check on him. And man, God's all over him. He just feels bad. I said, I got to go out and get my job done. I got to get it back on. She's so upset. About 40 minutes later, I'm working. Behind me, head on my shoulder. From behind. There's that shiny head. 
I looked in his face and began to cry. I guess he's not the same man. Just look in his face. He's not the same man. And I said, yeah. You just held him cry right now. How powerful is that? <clears throat> Come on. That sure beats having work issues and boss troubles and fairness. And, and it sure beats stuff. <laughs> Amen. Nobody even asked a question forever, right? I'm like just preaching or what? What was your question? Or am I just no, talking this all this time? this is a new time? question. Okay, so where did I get all that from? I don't even know what I'm doing. Healing. <laughs> Healing? <laughs> that was the broadest answer I ever gave in my life. <laughs> that stuff's helpful, though, because it teaches you what you can live in the moment unless you have other attitudes and other things tripping you up. If you're letting Chris get on your nerves instead of, letting him make a draw on you. Mercy, realizing if he knew what he was doing, he wouldn't be that way. And you start hurting for Chris because he's lost rather than, boy, he's really mocking me and stage, upstaging me in front of the guys. See, if you take it that way, you'll not hear that word for him. But if all you have is compassion for him, see, Jesus can tell himself anything. So if you're one with his heart, you're in. you got open communication. If your heart's pure. I've been in situations where God showed me young girls that were touch strong, gave me the name of the uncle that did it. Why? Because he knows how I'll see them and he knows how I'll talk to them and he knows what he wants to do for them. It's pretty awesome when God will give you those kind of things. I was in a situation with a mother. I said, ma'am, you have two, two sons. They're in their 30s. Yeah. They think you're psychic. You're, they're in their 30s. Yeah. One's in prison. The youngest, the oldest, is heading there real soon. And you're living condemned as a mother. And you're blaming it on yourself. And you said to them, these four kids, they won't be in jail. It's deception. I said, don't make a noise. She's hyperventilating. She can't even breathe. She's crying so hard. And God sent me to you to tell you these things to get you out of this world of condemnation. So you can be more productive again because you're actually an amazing mother. And he wants your heart beat for him once again. And I just held her and she clinged to me and said, whoa. As God released her from that condemnation. You want to hear those kind of things. I've had some highlight stuff like that that was just bam. I'm in a restaurant getting salad bar and, and a man looks nice and God said he's cold and he's far from me. And I'm like, he looks kind of nice. He says, no, no. He said, I walk over, I said, he said, this is hi. I'm like, Lord, you got the wrong guy. <laughs> like, this guy's nice. And I'm ready to get some salad out. And I said, hey, man, I said, can I talk to you for a minute? So what's up? And I said, man, I was sitting over there and I was just praying. And when I said praying, they can't believe. Talk about Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde. This was it, man. And I said, wow. He said, now you listen to me, young man. He was a very, he could have been almost my grandfather. He was up there. He said, if you're one of these soliciting Christians, pushing your faith and trying to get me to receive your Jesus. I don't even believe in you, Jesus. I don't even believe in God. He's just tearing me up right in the restaurant. I'm just standing there totally unfazed, just waiting for him to finish. <laughs> just standing there, kind of half smiling like, oh, wow. God, you're always right. As God told me, man, he's not doing good. I thought, Lord, I think you better reevaluate this man. He looks pretty nice. So I said, I was praying. I'm standing there. You want to be on this end of the stick. You're unfazed by all these things because you know your heart. You have no need to upstage him. You have no need to correct him. You actually care about his well-being, his future, and God's inspiring him. You're not even trying to evangelize him. That gets him personal. You just want to love him with the Jesus that's in him. And I looked at him and I said, well, sir, it's easy to understand why you feel that way. Because when this happened to your son, you said in your heart, I can't believe God would let this happen. So I'm going to have to believe there is no God. And ever since then, your life's been hurt. And in Israel, it was not responsible for that with your son. There was a war going on and they were playing in his life. And Satan's crawling around a snake in the grass. And I just tapped him on the chest. I said, this is one more time. The Lord's not going to let go of your heart. And he's saying, come back home to me. Repent and give your life and your heart back to me. And he's just standing there. He can't even function. 
because I knew what killed his son, I knew what happened, and I knew what he said in his heart. That's pretty easy to think. The Lord said, leave him alone right now. Leave him alone. You think you got him on the ropes. Might as well do the knockout punch and then shaka bundai all over him or something, you know. Instead, the Lord says, leave him. I just turned and went right out, paid my bill and left. I looked over my shoulder as I'm heading out. He's still trying to get to his table. He's walking. Literally, it looked like he needed 911. He has nothing on his plate. And he sat and he stared. Why? Some water. So, some water. It's God who gives the increase. You say, well, did you lead him to the Lord? I gave him the Lord. Now he has to deal with that. Come on. Yeah? We'll get to your question now. I'm sorry. Go for it. You got a question? Go ahead. You were talking she about has a mic. We're going to let her in and we can get to you, sir. We were talking about traditions and ingrained in our minds. I was born and raised in church, went to a Christian school, went to a Christian college, and I love the Lord, and I really, you know, I want to live for him, but I do, just being real, struggle with seeing Christians and judging them, and I just want to know how I can work with that and get rid of that, and I don't want to have that. You give me permission logic to just, in my mind. Can I answer you real openly? You're going to let me be your friend and not get mad at me? You can. That's why I'm asking you. I'm so, I don't want. Uh, I'll get you over hard. judging them real quick, all right? <laughs> See, that's a critical eye, and we don't even realize how presumptuous it is. It actually has pride behind it. So, so if I would say to you, are you perfect? Are you walking in the light as he's in the light? Are you walking in the full manifestation of Jesus' as nature is present? You'd probably say, no, I, I'm working on it. So if you're not there, why are you judging people for where they are or where they aren't? Here's what happens. If you start looking at people for what's wrong with them instead of what they're created to and for, it won't be long until something's wrong with you. Because where there's judgment, there's no mercy. And where no mercy is given, no mercy is received. You become the very thing you're fixing your eyes on. So here you are judgmental towards Christians, but are you turning the world upside down? I'm just answering you straight. I'm not being mean. So we have to go, wait a minute, whoa. So always look to your own life and to yourself. Don't look to others and be responsible and a steward of your own conscience, not another man's conscience. Do you get what I'm saying? Steward your own heart, not another man's heart. So I can get my eyes on 10 people that are saying one thing and living another. If I don't have access to them, if I'm not their friend and they don't let me instruct them, I can't let where they're not determine where I am. i got to keep my eyes on truth and continue to be a living epistle, not projecting on them, but living in the light and trusting that my life's going to help make a difference in everyone around me. But I can't let what they don't see determine what I do see. You see what I'm saying? So to get critical and judgmental of Christians is actually a presumptuous, self-righteous expression because none of us have arrived to the full expression of Christ. So we're not to find fault with one another. We're to look to bring out the best in one another. So here's the deal. Why has it been so easy to cry because of people instead of cry for people? Why has it been so easy to get frustrated at people instead of feel mercy towards people? Because we've thought for ourselves from our own opinions and our own life. You see what I'm saying? So when Jesus sees those people, is he critical and judgmental? Or does grace abound more? Does he try to woo them and draw them to himself? Does he want to father them and lead them and guide them in truth? He doesn't say, oh, I can't believe that man. They just killed him. You see what I'm saying? So it's you got to understand that because you were taught to feel that way. This is instinctive, but it's the fall of man. The way that seems right to man trained us to have those attitudes. To have, I mean, I've seen people come together, and I've done it before Jesus, where you come together and you'll just talk about somebody like you're their master, and you just critique them, put them down, laugh about them, and, and like, like you're more than them. See, every time you do that, it's self-righteous. You're talking down on people. It's a good sign that you're being self-righteous when you talk down on people. When all you can do is fix on where people are. All you do is just sit and have a 10-minute complaint session about your church, your pastor, or a church down the street. Whew. Total expression of pride and self-righteousness and deception. Because if those churches and people are those things, why aren't we praying, interceding, asking for the move of God, and asking God to bring increase? Come on, be real with me. It's because we've been trained by life itself, not the giver of life. That 
these things are normal, so it's easy to cop an attitude, easy to have an opinion, easy to give a peace of mind. Here's the other thing I want to help you with. If you weigh what those judgments are producing, it'll expose that it's not coming from the Lord. There's, there's no life in it. You see what I mean? So it doesn't benefit them and it doesn't benefit you, so it's a zero. It's just the way that seems right. It's a hasty fall, not a resurrection. Am I making sense to you? So don't be conformed to the world. Be by... So how are we transformed? By thinking like we've never thought before. Renewing. By thinking like we've never thought before. You get it? Yeah. That's good for you. You got another question? We're ending at four, aren't we? Man, I went on a preaching tangent a while ago, didn't I? We'll end at 4.15 because we started at 2.15. Um, you buy in 15 minutes? <laughs> Are you okay with just one last question? I think this gentleman over here has been waiting a while. Yeah, there's a couple questions. I'm good okay. if, if we're going to And then what we're going to do... Uh, He's waiting too. Look at this. Okay, so... We'll go with this gentleman right now, and we'll see when I'll Pastor do, Dan I'll finishes. just do my best to go quick. Okay, cool. Let's try to knock a couple out. Okay, cool. Um, so we'll go you first, and then who's next after that? Well, the, man, the man in the okay. green and, there, and there. this gentleman, they both One, two, have three. questions. We're okay, good. Cool. Let's, if we can get through them three, we're doing good. Let's try Okay, it. cool. All right. Let's I'm see. challenged. Let's see if we can do this. Well, I've actually got two. Is that okay? <laughs> <laughs> go ahead, man. Yeah. <laughs> Your no, question's uh, built because you waited a long time. They multiply. Yeah. Which, uh, give me your first question. The first question, question um, this is uh, me asking for a friend because he's not here, but he wanted me to ask in the Q&A session. Um, he's uh, looking at stepping into ministry and he's interested in that, and he wants to know, like, what should he focus on, I guess, to prepare for that? Yeah, well, that's a real good question. Please don't any of you try to push into ministry. It's okay to have your desire, but don't ever try to make ministry happen. Make sure Jesus is happening. You have to have a relationship with Jesus. Be complete in him. Find yourself in him. Come on. You can't let ministry identify you and decide who you are. You're only as good as ministry's go. So there's so many young people with this aspiration to get into ministry. And sometimes what they're saying is, I want to get paid for what I do. I want to get paid for doing Jesus. No. Have a relationship with Jesus. Get your heart in him. I'll give you Mark 3. You tell him to read Mark 3, verse 13. And Jesus called them to himself who he himself wanted, and they came to him. And he ordained them and appointed them that they would be with him, that they might be with him, and that he would send them out to preach, heal, and do mighty things in his name. Okay. So he's calling the disciples to himself who he himself wanted. Why would he call you if he didn't want you? You say, well, Dan, he's talking to the disciples. No, no, no. No man comes to God unless he's drawn by him. So if you're here with a desire for God, it's because grace is drawing you and you're responding. Why would God draw you if he didn't want you? When they came, we came. Here we are, right? Okay, so we're in Jesus. If I'd say who's saved, who's purpose to grow in God, who believes they're born again, most of you would raise your hand. So God drew us, we came. What did he ordain us to and appoint us to? That we might be with him. With him is before being sent. Yeah? In fact, don't go if you haven't been with him. Don't go if you haven't been with him. Because you'll just go in the name of ministry instead of the power and the spirit. And you'll let ministry define who you are and how you're doing. It'll get weird and strange. And one day you might even be discouraged and yet he's still Lord. <laughs> so it's not wrong to desire ministry, but be filled with Jesus and strong fellowship with him and let ministry flow out of well-being, not strong doing. You all right? Okay, second question. Quick. Second question. This was something you spoke on last night. So you talked about in Second Peter, how his divine power has bestowed us everything yeah. uh, we need for life and godliness. Right. And he has bestowed on us these precious promises so that we may be partakers of the divine nature. And then you said, 
Uh, Having that's, escaped the corruption that's in the world through lust. Yes, and he said uh, that that scripture had nothing to do with, you know, our barns being filled and everything, and which was really awesome because I'd never heard it preached that way. But So with that, I, I know you weren't talking about prosperity, but I was just curious, like, what is your view on um, prosperity, like, in the Christian life? I uh, think it's awesome to have everything you need to do his will and fulfill what he created you for. Anything else is an added blessing. So it's just that simple. Uh, I'm not into you having all the excesses. And some people are they're going to all these meetings trying to get a million dollars through prayer and stuff. And the reason it isn't coming because it'll destroy you and you won't handle it right because you want it too bad. You know, it's just there's, there's a weirdness out there. It's all about prosperity. Are you kidding me? Come on. Be prosperous in the things that matter most, right? The heart of God, love, mercy, peacemaking, all that good stuff. Is it wrong to have your bills paid? Is it wrong to get a good job? Is it wrong to believe for a promotion? Man, go for it, but make sure you're walking in his image and shining as a light. Is it wrong to buy a new house or want something a little bigger for more space or whatever? Or you just think it's nice, so you spend it? No, that's between you, your conscience, and God. I would never judge you for that. But as you're doing those things, make sure you're living the faith and shining as a light in your sphere of influence. That's what will show that you're a healthy person all the way around. If you're just trying to use your faith to get stuff from God, it's not cool. Not cool at all. In fact, most people reduce the gospel to blessings and a, and a gospel that serves them. It's a beneficiary gospel. So they have faith scriptures all over their fridge that they're quoting every morning before work. And all that they're quoting is scriptures that benefit their day, not transform their life to cause them to shine. You're not called to use your faith to get something from God. Your faith is to walk through with a perspective every challenge of life and never let life change you because the life in you already has. You with me? Okay. We nailed that? Good answer? Sir. Hello, Pastor. Yes. Uh, way back in 1980, this question of mine is already nobody, no, no pastors answer me. It's about Genesis 6, verse 6, and the Valley of Ephraim. Is the DNA of these angels we still have it even up to now. Yeah, that's, man, that's a question, buddy. What in the world? <laughs> it's, it, he's talking about, he's talking about the, uh, the, the angels coming together with the sons of men and the sons of God, right? And he said, or what are you actually asking? Is that DNA here? Well, that's a strange section of scripture. I know one thing. A flood came after all that and wiped out everything. I'm, I'm not sure about that DNA. Let me, talk, let me talk about the flood a little bit quick, though. The angel thing, and they were coming together with the daughters of men. It, it, it's a strange scripture. It actually sounds like fallen spirits are coming, having sexual relations with women, and they were having children to them. And they were a giant family. They were giants and stuff like that. I, that's scriptural. So, but obviously that was all written before the floods came. But then again, you see, you see giant families in David's day, Goliath and Nack and all these people. There's different ones. So I don't know, and I'm not putting your question down. I've, I'm, I've never thought all that stuff out and been intrigued. But I, I have looked at the, the whole Genesis era where men were continually evil in their hearts. And there was wickedness on the earth, and it said that God was sorry that he made man. That's a strange scripture right there. And, 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 but you have to understand when you read the Bible, don't get confused and think God's schizophrenic or having an up and down day. The whole focal point of the Bible is the Lord Jesus Christ. So everything is pointing to him and him to come once the fall of man comes, Right? So you always want to find interpretation in your Bible that points to Jesus through the Old Testament, or you're going to think God's a murderer, you're going to misunderstand, they're reaping what they've sowed, there's a law of sin and death in place, they didn't have a revelation of the devil, so they thought everything that happened was God. And that's passed on through tradition. There's people today that say everything that happens is the doing of God. It's unscriptural. Ooh, not of all you believe it. I can feel the stiffness in the room. 
Everything that happens is not the doing of God. There's men being destroyed for the lack of knowledge. Get the knowledge, stop destruction. He put the power of death and life in our tongues. He could be will and life. You keep speaking death and you reap what you sow. It's his will and desire that all men be saved and filled with the knowledge of truth. Is every man saved and filled with the knowledge of truth? Well, then everything he desires isn't happening. And somehow we got this flighty, sovereign idea, and we think it's spiritual to just say, well, everything, it's all under God's control. No, he gave the earth to the children of man. He told you to subdue it. He told you to not live in fear. He told you to not live in unforgiveness. He told you to show mercy, to use the power of his name, to pray without ceasing. I wonder if we're doing any of that, or are we just passing the coin over to God and saying he's the guy that's doing it? Oh, hey, whatever will be, will be. He's a mystery. Now, that doesn't work for me. But this doesn't really answer your question, but this is just something you stirred in me, okay? DNA of those angels. The, 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 the Here's how I'm going to answer your question. I, th I think I know what you're asking. Not, I'm not in the sexual connotation there. The DNA is there in the sense that men are possessed by spirits. Men are in agreement with evil. There's a DNA of what they represent in today's society in a large way. Are you following what I'm saying? But it's all to be overcome through Christ, and the church isn't even to focus on that. It's never about darkness. It's always about light. You follow what I'm saying? So is light greater than darkness? So arise, shine, church, the light. Darkness will cover the earth, deep darkness the people. So he lets us know that so we're not surprised. But the light is on you. So what's greater? So is that DNA on the earth? It's, it's on the earth in the sense of the spiritual. I, we could talk about a lot of things spiritual that I've experienced over the years. They're real. But... but What's the first sign of a believer in Mark 16? The first sign of a believer. These signs shall follow those that believe. No, no. They will. What? No, they'll speak with new tongues. That's one we fight over tooth and nail and we've divided over. It's the first sign of a believer. It's one we fight over. The second one is we cast out devils. Most people don't admit they're around, and most people live their whole Christian life and never even understand what that could possibly mean, but it's the sign of a believer. <laughs> I'm just saying. So this stuff's real. This stuff's real. It pops up, it comes, goes. I've seen people get delivered just hugging them. I've, I've preached and had things leave in a service. I, I can tell you a lot of cool stories. We're not to focus on devils. We're not running. We're not witch hunting. We're not demon crazy. But, but is that... Is there something about the fallen spirits and things in today's DNA and society? Yeah, there's people possessed, man. There's people that are studying witchcraft. There's people. I prayed for a lady that was a Christian that dabbled in witchcraft. She started dabbling in witchcraft as a Christian. And when I got around her, that she wanted a baptism of the Holy Spirit. When they brought her up, she got scared and didn't want me to touch her. And they said, I don't know what's going on with her. She's freaking out. Like she wanted prayer, and now she's like freaking out. And I'm like, something ain't right. So I went to pray for her real gentle. She just rolled her eyes and collapsed on the floor, and she just fell on the floor. I thought, what is going on? So I went to pray for her, and she started praying in tongues. And everybody around was going, whoa, yay, whoa, yay. And the Lord said, tell it to hush and tell it to leave. Well, I have to get that discernment. I'm in leadership. I, it's not because I'm more spiritual than them. I said, you hush and you leave. And she quit praying in tongues. And just laid there. And I leaned down and I whispered. I said, hon, have you been dabbling in witchcraft? Her eyes are closed. She never opened them. She shook her head. And I heard two forms of things she was playing with. And I said it. She shook her head. I said, honey, no, no, no. And I explained some things to her. And I said, look, if you could go back and, and redo that. If you could change your mind. If you could close that chapter. Would you? Would you? You're not going back to that. No. Could you? Would you change that? Yeah. I said, man, that's awesome. I said, you spirit is in here. Watch. I'm not trying to be weird. Six inches off the ground, her whole body just comes. Now, see, that's the devil trying to get you caught up in the phenomenon of that and impress you. 
I'm way more impressed with Jesus than a person floating. I was in a house where the crib toys were floating above the baby. And the mom is freaked out. I said, honey, it's a magic trick. It's spirits holding the toys up, whatever it is. I was in a house where the flashlight went from the counter to the table and then back to the counter. And she's like, look, see? Ah!" I said, honey, let me show you what just happened. There's a spirit in your house. You see me, you didn't see it. You're freaked out. Come on, it's no big deal. So we prayed, things left, nothing never happened again. The crib toys came down. The lady, you know how things made a scene with Jesus when he was cast out and then he hushed and told him to not, and, right? This lady, it was terrible. Oh, it shook me up. I told her to leave. She's six inches off the ground. Her head goes, bam. And when it came up, her bottom end went, bam, 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 about four times. This thing went, bam, bam, and thrashed her around. I said, you stop it and let her go. And poof, she just fell on the floor. I just held her and embraced her and prayed her, and she began to pray in tongues, and the Spirit of God came upon her. Now watch this. The 12-year-old boy came over, and he grabbed me. And he said, can you pray for me like that? What he meant was with results, with power, because he was saying, I know something's wrong. And I said, I said, son, what's going on? I just need you to pray for me. And mom's crying. I just set her up. I said, mama, is your boy been going into violent fits of rage and expressions of extreme anger? He's like, highly concerned. <gasps> and he's just standing there crying. Here the Lord showed me because of this witchcraft stuff and Vikings and Garvey that this thing mocked her. He's a firstborn. There's Old Testament stuff you can track, right? You say, well, we're in the New Testament. Yeah, but you better live in that New Testament because this thing's marking her firstborn and it was a spirit came upon him to rage him and cause him to do something unthinkable and one day he'll be sitting in a cell somewhere shaking, wondering how he did. You get what I'm saying? It was going to drive him to kill somebody and I saw it all by the spirit. I prayed for him and that thing left him. He just smelled him and wept and held him. She said he's never had an outrage since. This stuff's real. You don't play with it. You don't give no place to the devil and you're not unaware of his devices. Are we trying to honor him and worship him by talking about it? No, we're saying let's live sharp and sober because everything that happens is not ordained by God. Sometimes we cause it to happen. You follow me? I could tell you 25 more stories like that just like that. But here's the thing I want to tell you about Genesis. And, and Was there somebody else with a question? What was your question? Just so I know what I'm looking at. So you talked about uh, the churches that they teach you about just prosperity and all this goodness and everything. I guess we used to, we go to a church. Yeah, and, and but don't hear, I'm not against, no. you know, I'm just saying, man, be careful that that's not your pursuit. It's not wrong to be blessed. It's not wrong for God to provide, no, right? No, my question, I'm sorry, my question, I don't want to interrupt you. Like, yeah, I just want you to understand, I'm not against anybody specifically. I'm saying, let's have a stronger message than that. That's not our goal for being Christian. Today I see that because of that, it took me a very long time to realize what God truly is and what, that he's not a magician. He is yeah. a God. And, and he's not your bus boy or your table waiter. <laughs> exactly. Either. So... I know that's why it took me forever, but we're so grateful because we have met great mentors in that church that taught us this. And that's what my question is. As, a, as the head of the house, I was thinking about, should we stay in that church to reach as many as we can with the truth, the truth of the gospel, or should we move to a different church, which not always is the right answer because I like when people stay personally, but that's not a question I can answer. You ask Jesus, you'll know exactly what to do. I'm all about you staying, but go ahead and ask Jesus. Yeah? Because see, you're growing in the truth right now. You're growing in the truth. Your eyes are open. You're not limited to the prosperity doctrine. You have a bigger truth burning in your heart. So you're not threatened by going there. Listen, guys, don't always go to church and say, well, they're supposed to feed me. No, you're supposed to be eating at home. You're supposed to be with Jesus. Now, don't think pastors are always supposed to serve you up a dish. Come on, man. You're supposed to be eating and feeding. It's a buffet of heaven. 
But this thing, this, this gentleman back here stirred me up with Genesis 6. I got to do this quick, and I do it in two minutes. I know you don't believe me, Audrey. I feel the unbelief. It's all right. I'll come over here. I feel it coming off of her now. Oh, my goodness. I'm going to get this done. So watch this. I'm having fun. So God says, men are evil and continually wicked in their heart, et cetera, et cetera. He tells Noah, build an ark. He brings his flood. So we hear flood, right? So, so you know the story, right? Everybody dies. The earth's covered. And then the waters recede, and he lets out the bird. He goes, you know, come back. And all of a sudden, yeah, and there's the story, right? So God comes, and he reinstates some things and speaks over Noah. And if you listen to what he said, it's almost what he said to Adam. It's really about the same. It's really, really close. Same thoughts, same principles. That astounds me because God hasn't changed. But here's the point. He said, I'll never destroy the earth this way again. And he puts a rainbow in the sky and assure that promise. And I got looking into that and all of a sudden I realized because I'm looking for how to see Jesus in everything. All of a sudden it hits me. Oh my goodness, what happened in Genesis 6? The earth was unrighteous, full of unrighteousness, continually wicked men in their hearts, Right? So God baptized the earth in water. And when he brought the earth out of the water, there was no unrighteousness. It was all removed. But it was at the cost of men's lives. So he looked and said, hey, under this old thing that we're under right now, and this whole law of sin and death thing and all this stuff, and the way it works, and men reaping with itself, it cost men their life. But I'll tell you, there's a baptism coming. That will take away all unrighteousness, but restore men's lives. And the earth will never be destroyed this way again. Puts a rainbow in the sky. And what he's doing is pointing to a day we'll be baptized in the name of the Lord. And come out and all unrighteousness is gone. And yet life's restored. Phenomenal. You always think flood growing up as a kid. You see the movies. All God did was baptize the earth in water. And when he brought the earth out of the water, eight righteous souls remember. Remember, we're saved through water. First Peter 3, Peter had a revelation. He said, he said there were eight righteous souls in the day of Noah that were saved, saved through water. The word sozo. You say, well, I thought it's the blood that saves me. It is. And they were saved through water. He said, not the cleansing of your flesh, the answer of a good conscience before God. And you have this antitype which now saves you. Water baptism. Peter had the revelation by the Spirit of God that in the days of Noah, the flood was a water baptism of the earth. And we have the same anti-type right now that will save us with the answer of a good conscience before God because anything that comes through the water is righteous in God. It was, it's right in First Peter. You can't miss it. And then what's God do? Puts a rainbow in the sky and promises that it'll never happen this way again. Isn't that powerful? Yeah. So even if that DNA is on the earth, it's not, it's not a threat to us. Let's let the DNA of our created value in Christ come in us, and let's let light overcome darkness, and let's turn men from the power of Satan to the power of God. Do you get it? Why don't you stand to your feet with me, and we're going to pray. Man, questions are fun. You were right. I couldn't do it in two minutes. No, your unbelief was sustained. It was all good. <laughs> You guys want to pray with me, would you? You guys want to live this? Are you guys getting something out of all this? Are you encouraged? Come on. Here's the cool thing. I said it three times now. This will be about the fourth time. Nothing I'm preaching, there's nothing I'm preaching you can't live if you separate yourself from any other factor in your life. There's, there's nothing I'm preaching that you can't live if you see your life apart from any other factor. If you let something else creep in, say, yeah, but, well, you don't know what I got to go through. Well, you don't know how she treats me. Well, you don't know what he said. All that, if you really listen to what I'm saying, is rendered useless in the light of this truth. You can live this life apart from any other factor in your life. So the real question is, what are you going to do with this Jesus? And how are you going to respond? Please respond by simple faith and give strong yes. Amen? So Father, I pray over this house believing there's a strong yes in this house. I just pray for grace to continue to teach us and empower us, mold us and shape us into what you paid for and what you desired from the beginning. God, I'm just asking for a grace to come on our lives to separate us from that way that seems right to a man. Let us be new wineskins to contain the new wine. And Lord God, I pray that none of us would get tricked and trapped just incorporating you into the life that is, but we bring you into a brand new life that's coming. 
Lord, I just thank you it's not Jesus Incorporated, it's Lives Transformed. So, Lord, I just pray that blessing over us. I thank you we run well. I thank you we make peace and we show love. In Jesus' holy name, I pray these things. Amen?